This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. It is my pleasure to welcome everybody today to the, I think it's the 100 and, what is it, 37th, if I am thinking of this right. Is that correct, Emma? 137th long table? All right, got the number right. Um, and it is my great pleasure to um, welcome our speaker today, Gita Ingvardson, who I met actually about six months ago, virtually. I still haven't met her in person, but we were both invited to speak um, at a virtual conference hosted by some colleagues in Stockholm on uh, shipwrecks and coins. Um, and uh, um, so she was uh, talking then about um, uh, just uh, some uh, material that, that has been found in shipwrecks in, in uh, the Baltic area. And I was uh, talking about shipwreck coins in general, but um, uh, I subsequently invited her if she was willing to um, give a long table and uh, she graciously responded that she would be willing. And so uh, she will be talking to us today about uh, Viking hordes um, in the Baltic Sea area, which is an exciting topic, something I'm looking forward to. Um, Gita is a um, curator at um, a museum at Lund University, a historical university in uh, Sweden. She's actually Danish, and so she crosses over from Denmark, where she lives, to uh, Sweden, you know, with some regularity. Um, but she's also uh, at the uh, National Museum of Denmark, so doing double du duty in two museums as a curator there. So. Um, it is my great pleasure then to turn this over to you, Gita, and very much look forward to what you have to say today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, uh, for giving me this opportunity to present my work on the silver hordes of the Viking Age. Um, in Scandinavia and in the regions settled by Vikings, for example, in France and England, hundreds of silver hordes were deposited by the Vikings. Uh, from the 9th to the 11th centuries. The hordes were created by people's choices and actions. People with different cultural, ethnic, social, religious backgrounds accumulated the hordes. The hoarded objects were produced in many different parts of the world and traveled long distances because of trade, raids, immigration, marriages or diplomacy. The hordes were deposited because of unrest and fear of assault, hidden before a planned journey, stashed away as savings or raw deposits, and deposited as cultural and ritual depositions. Today, I will argue that these choices and actions are traceable in the structures and deposition context of the hordes. In other words, we can trace the Vikings that accumulated, handled, and deposited the hordes and we can identify the accumulation strategies they used. To understand who, how, and why, it is essential to study all parts of the hordes. We cannot just examine the coins or just look at the jewelry. We need to investigate all objects and their archaeological contexts. I have therefore chosen the Viking hordes of Bonholm as the starting point of my investigation. Bornholm is this uh, little island in the middle of the Baltic Sea. You can see in, at the map here, Bornholm, we have Sweden, Denmark, northern part of Germany, and the northern part of Poland. The hoarding on Bornholm is intense. More than 100 Viking Age hordes are deposited between the years around 850 to 1150 on an island covering only 588 square kilometers. However, what makes the Bonholm Hortz unique is the numbers combined with their high degree of documentation. Archaeological excavations of a minimum of 200 square meters have been conducted on no less than 34 Hortz sites on Bonholm, and this is unique. The extensive documentation provides an extra dimension when interpreting the hordes. Earlier research has focused on the content of the hordes, but the excavated Bonholm hordes enabled me to include the archaeological context on an unprecedented scale in the interpretation and allows me to get close 
to the holding Vikings. Firstly, I will introduce you to some of my theoretical ideas and my methodological approach. I find inspiration in Pierre Bourdieu's notion on capital and fields, and will shortly present how I see hordes as potential actors in the economic, as well as the social, cultural, and symbolic fields. Then I will introduce you to some of the Vikings behind the hordes. We shall meet the people who imported, handled, and deposited the Deerham hordes of the 10th century. I will argue that the accumulation of the early Viking hordes was based on social networks and that women played an important role in the import, handling and deposition of silver. I will also introduce you to some of the islanders from the 11th century and argue that the participation in the Viking raids at the English uh, uh, coast facilitated social mobility. And finally, I will present the horde of the last Viking of the world. But before you meet the Vikings, I will present my theoretical background. The Viking used different strategies when they accumulated silver. They could participate in raids, form marriages or sell their goods at the markets. The Vikings could affect the silver and change its function, for example, by transforming a, a coins into jewelry. These coins started their life by having a monetary function, but was pierced and suspended and changed function to ornament. Or the Vikings could accumulate coins with a monetary function in England and deposit them on a field on Van Holm as a symbolic action. As is the case with the Tuskegee Horde, which you see over here. The hoard consists of 82 English coins of the same type with very, very few traces of use. The hoard was deposited in an area without other archaeological remains. In England, the coins had a monetary function, but the coins got a symbolic function on Van Holm when the hoard was deposited in a special context. I will return to this later. Conversely, hordes could affect the life of the humans. This rock with a runic inscription tells of Orimon, who bought this farm for riches acquired in the east. The rock is situated on the burial ground of a farm in Veda, north of Stockholm in Sweden. The riches or the wealth mentioned on the rock was probably silver, and affected Orimon's everyday life and his social position because he was now able to buy a farm. In the analysis, I focus on the relationship between hoard and owner. I can document that differences in hoard structures and context reflect differences in functions. In other words, the raw deposit of the silversmith smith, has a different structure and deposition context than the ritual offering or the family savings of the farmer. I find that anthropologist Pierre Bourdieu's thoughts on capital and fields offer an inspiring work frame for this approach to hordes. Bourdieu describes a field as a battleground where the actors fight to gain control of the capital in the field. Bourdieu mentions four types of capital, economic, social, cultural and symbolic. Inspired by Bourdieu, my theoretical starting point is that different types of hordes had different functions and that one horde could fill out several functions for the people who accumulated and deposited them. Let me exemplify. To the left, we see a selection of objects from the Budego horde. The hoard contained a large number of Islamic coins reworked into jewelry and the three-foil brooch deliberately destroyed by bending. The hoard was deposited in an area without other archaeological remains. The particular hoard composition indicates that the owner was a woman and we find the same composition of objects in women's graves. The specially selected objects 
the deliberately destroyed brooch and the deposition context indicates that the deposition of the hoard was a symbolic action without the intention of retrieval of the hoard. Thus a hoard represent symbolic capital. Perhaps a hoard was deposited to mark ownership of or as a sacrifice to newly cultivated fields and thereby giving the owner economic as well as social capital. I will also return to Budego later. To the right, we see a small selection of the Nordre Stensubigo hoard. It consists of coins in a miserable condition with numerous traces of secondary treatments. They are bent, fragmented, and have many test marks. The hoard was deposited in a pit with silver smithing debris close to a herd-like structure. Hence, the hoard has a completely different structure and deposition context than the Budgo hoard. The poor state of the coins and the archaeological context demonstrates that the hoard represents the raw material deposit of a silversmith. The two examples reveal that hoards did not only function as actors in the economic, but also the cultural, social, and symbolic fields. The two examples also show that I include the secondary treatment of objects as an important element in the interpretation. Here you can see some different examples of secondary treatment. My personal favorite is the dirham in the middle here, broken, uh, pierced, and stitched together again with silver wire. We can only imagine the thoughts uh, that are behind uh, this actions. My purpose of studying pecks and nicks and notches and bending and fragmentation and scratches and piercing, suspensions and graffiti is to encapsulate the intention behind these modifications and alterations. I work with a biographical perspective on both objects and hordes. The mutual influence between man and silver emerges in the changes and object experience between the production and the deposition. An example is coins made into amulets. You can see the remains of uh, Cufic writing here on the little handle of this uh, uh, shield shaped amulet. It shows that the handle is made from an Arabic coin, probably from the 900s. Humans have transformed the coin into amulet, while the amulet with its power protects the human bearing it. The transformation of the coin thereby brings the owner symbolic capital. The example demonstrates that an object's function or meaning is reflected in its form and use, and that changing in form and use reflects changing in function. To capture this dynamic interaction between human and silver, I work with three stages of object biographies, production, circulation, and deposition. The production data of 3,869 objects are included in my survey. Together, they reflect the amount of silver that was imported and circulated on the Bonholm Island. At deposition, a selection of these objects was encapsulated. And these encapsulated objects display the biography of the hordes. The pie chart illustrates uh, the range of the total hoard material. The hordes marked with a black cycle uh, represent different subgroups of the total amount of silver deposited in hordes on Bornholm. The three hordes marked in the charge are deposited in the decades just before or after the year 1000. But despite a similar dating, they show very different characteristics. The Tyskegård hoard consists exclusively of English coin, as you can see here. I have a picture of it here. The Ing Ingvang hoard consists of a mixture of English and German coins and a large proportion of jewelry. You can see here, the jewelry is in the bottom of the picture. 
while the Osmanic gold hoard includes ingots, scrap silver, and Islamic coins. The diversity reflects that the hoards do not represent a random sample of the available silver, that the hoards reflect people's choices and actions. And now I will move on to some of the hoarding Vikings of Bonholm. We will begin uh, with some of the strong and powerful women of the Viking Age Bonholm. Three Bonholm hordes seem to be connected to the same event uh, where Samanite diahems were imported to Bonholm, probably just after 920. And the three hordes, Rabeke Gård, Skørebro and Bude Gård, were probably all owned by women. This is a map of Bonholm, and here we have Rabeke Gård, Skørebro and Bude Gård. Rabeke Gård was deposited in a grave. Among the grave goods were 14 Samanat dirhams. The coins have a relatively uniform chronological profile and are minted in the first two decades of the 900s. The grave also contained an Omiyat dirham struck 200 years before in 712 or 13. The early Omiyat dirham was pierced and looped and was probably part of a jewelry set consisting of 27 beads and two bronze pendants that were also found in the grave. The 14 Samanat dirhams are without suspension and should be interpreted as a Samanat hoard deposited in grave context. The earliest hoard, hoards in the Baltic region with significant influx of Samanat dirhams are found on Gotland. If we go to the map, here we have Bonholm, and here we have uh, Gotland. Uh, Gotland succeeds Bonholm uh, in the amount of hordes. We know of more than 750 hordes, Viking hordes deposited on Gotland, uh, but very few of them have been excavated. The Samanite Deerham seems to reach Gotland shortly after their minting. From Gotland, they were dispersed westwards to Ireland as you can see here. And with the Arbeke Gård here and or Randle as a kind of intermediate stops. The atypical uh, distribution probably reflects personal contact networks rather than organized trade networks. Therefore, the Rabeke Gård hoard may reflect a direct contact between the buried person and someone on Bonholm and reflect an exchange system of early seminar dirhams. An unusual chronological profile of the Skørebro hoard, it was the one placed here, uh, adds an extra dimension to the interpretation of the Rabeke Gård hoard. Except for two coins, all coins in the hoard, in the Skørebro hoard, are dated within the frame 892 to 918. If you look at this chart, it uh, visualizes visualizes the the biography of the of the hoard, the chronological biography of the hoard. Uh, every line represents a coin in the hoard. And the line is then, uh, this coin is then uh, dated to 892 to 907. And by this way, we can, we can see how the, how the, the hordes were constructed. As you can see, most hordes are deposited in, in this period, but we have two later Diahem. Uh, one struck in Samarkand in 927 to 32, that one, and a Deham struck in Tashkent in 800, in, sorry, in, in 938 to 39. And this tells us that the hoard was deposited after 939. The Skørebo hoard was deposited in connection with a dwelling house. In and around the remains of the house, one of the earliest examples of a new type of pottery was found. 
The type was inspired by pottery in, Slav in the Slavic area, that's present-day Poland, and was introduced to Bonhoeffer during the 10th century. Pottery analysis shows that the new pottery type was produced by skilled workers on high status sites. Large amounts of the new pottery type was found at the site, and this testified that Skriopo was a high status settlement. And this is uh, from the work of Magdalena Nau, and uh, the type that was deposited on Skriopo is this uh, Viberop type. Except for the two later coins, the very close chronological profile suggests that the two hordes, Rabegego and Skyrbro, may reflect the same import event. Bo both hordes were accumulated and deposited by persons in the social and economic elite. Some coins were deposited shortly after the import in grave context on southwestern Bornholm, while some coins were deposited some 30 years later in settlement context on central Bornholm. A third hoard, the Budegård hoard, is deposited after 1047, but display elements of the same import horizon. As you can see here, the majority of the coins are Samanite dirhams over here. Our Samanite dirhams are struck before 920. As mentioned, the Budegård hoard contained a large number of Islamic coins reworked into jewelry, a threefold brooch deliberately destroyed by bending, and it also contained a bracelet, as you can see at, at the top. The particular composition indicates that the owner was a woman. The hoard was deposited in an area without other archaeological remains. The specially selected objects, the deliberate destroyed brooch, and the deposition context indicates that the deposition of the hoard was a symbolic action without the intention of retrieval of the hoard. <clears throat> Parallels to the threefold brooch and the bracelet are found on the Kanegegare site, just 2.4 kilometers from Bulgo. Again, we have Bornholm, and this is Budegård, and here we have Kanegegare, and these are the jewelry from Budegård, and these are the jewelry from Kanegegare. The threefold brooch is very unusual. We only know two parallels, both uh, from Bornholm. Uh, the bracelet and the brooch, it's not a part of the Kanegegare hoard. As you can see, the jewelry found is found uh, 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 far away from the where the hoard was deposited. Uh, this is the distribution of the objects in the hoards. The gray circles are coins, and the red circles are uh, other similar objects. And then we probably also have uh, other bronze objects, uh, which I don't know if they are a part of the hoard. Um, and here we have the two uh, pieces of threefold brooches, it's these two, and here we have the bracelet. So it's very unlikely that they were deposited in the hoard. But the unusual jewelry documents a clear relation between the two locations. In fact, a matrix was found at the Kennedy Gare site with the same brooched roset motif as the bracelet. This indicates that the jewelry were produced at Kennedy Gare. As you can see here, this matrix was used to produce this bracelet. <clears throat> a further similarity between the two hordes is an unusual high number of complete coins with suspensions. While the similarity of the inventory reflects that the hordes were probably linked to the same group of people, difference in the deposition context reflects that the Bulgo and the Kanegegare hordes had different functions. The Budegård hoard is, as mentioned, linked to the ritual, ritual field, while, while Kanegegea is deposited centrally on a settlement, probably representing family savings. I would like to suggest that the same people who established themselves at the Kanegegea site deposited the Budegård hoard to mark ownership of or as a sacrifice for newly cultivated fields. 
So to sum up, the deposition context for Bonholm hoards containing a market element of early Samanat coins minted before 920 suggests that women were involved in the distribution and handling of silver in the Viking Age. Two of the three hoards, Harbegegård and Budegård, show a connection to women by virtue of their composition and structure context. The connection between Budegård and Kanegegård further illustrates that the relationship between hoards and women were not exclusively related to the symbolic field. The hoard at Kanegegård's site was deposited in a house, with, which indicates that the hoard can constituted an economic and social capital. Furthermore, the context of the hordes show that the early import of Samanite dirhams was linked to the elite. This is illustrated by the Rabegegor grave connected to the dirham importers of Gotland and by the Skyrbro site's early dominance of the new pottery type called Baltic Sea Ware. The early import phase of Samanard Dirhems connects the three sites of Budegård, Rabegegård and Skørebro. Further, the close connection between Budegård and Kanegegård is reflected in the, new, in the unique jewelry and the very high proportion of coins converted into jewelry. The hordes are deposited on South West Bornholm, Central Bornholm and East Bornholm, respectively. The hordes thus reflect an elite network across the island. I will now document that Viking raids were a social and political game changer that generated social mobility in the Bonham society. By the end of the 10th century, there's a market rise in the deposition of hordes on Bonholm. As you can see it in the chart here, um, this is one hoard deposited, and <clears throat> these are only the excavated hordes uh, on Bonholm. And um, you can see there's a rise here in the deposition of hordes. The colors uh, indicates the dominant uh, coin type in the hoard. This rise in hoard deposition indicates that more people were involved in the accumulation and handling of silver. Silver hoarding goes from being reserved to a Bonholm elite to include a wider crowd of people. The increasing hoarding happens at the same time as West European coins, that is German and English coins, begin to dominate the hoards. Uh, you can see more detailed uh, the content of the hoards up here. And as you can see, we see a shift here uh, around 1,000. Uh, the earliest hordes are dominated by Arabic coins, but then we go to the hordes go to be dominated by English coins and later on by especially German coins. The early import of German coins seem to be linked to the same circle of people which was involved in the import of dirhams. The continuity between the people who imported and deposited hordes, both Islamic and uh, German coins, is exemplified at the Rosmanegor site, where the two deposited hordes show that people within the same settlement first deposited a hoard dominated by Islamic coins, and a few years later deposited a hoard with a market element of German coins. This is the composition of the Rosmanegor Southwest Horde. And as you can see, we have a clear element of uh, Islamic coins. And this is the Rosmanegor South Horde. It's the distribution down here. And as you can see, start off by uh, importing Islamic coins, and then it goes on to importing German coins. It's the red here. The blue are English coins. And this shows the distribution map of the two hordes. The gray dots are coins, and the red squares are other silver objects, and the green squares are bronzes.
However, at the turn of the millennium, the Bornholm hordes do not reflect continuity between the people who accumulated and deposited Islamic coins and the people who accumulated and deposited English coins. The import of English coins in the late 900s is particularly significant. Detailed analysis of the production data of the English coins shows that English coins found in hoards deposited in the decades around the year 1000 primarily, primarily were accumulated by participation in raids in England. Based on the production data of the coins, two hoards can probably be linked to expeditions mentioned in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle. Likely, the Storfrigo hoard was primarily accumulated by participation in raids in the 990s, perhaps in 993, while Tuskegee hoard was accumulated by participating in the 2002 raid on the English coasts. Tuskegee was deposited centrally on the island in an area without other clear signs of elite. The special structure of the Tuskegee hoard, consisting of only one type of coin, almost without circulation traces, are and deposited in an area without other archaeological remains, suggests that a hoard was a symbolic deposition. Here again, you see this uh, chart illustrating the composition of the of the hoard, and as you can see, there's only one type of coin with the same. Uh, dating, and over here at the picture you can see the coins look almost newly minted. The hoard may have been deposited again to mark ownership of or as sacrifice for newly cultivated fields. Thus, the accumulation of silver acquired through Viking raids in England seems to have influenced the social structure on Bornholm. By participating in raids, more people could accumulate silver and thereby create a position in society by, by acquiring land. The situation is similar to that described on the Veda rune stone in Uppsala, which tells the story of Orimon who bought a farm with the riches he had acquired in the East. This is just wealth acquired in the West. The Tuskegee hoard thus illustrates that the silver had agency in the social mobility on Bornholm. The Tuskegee and Storfrigård hoards were deposited shortly after their accumulation. Therefore, they consist entirely or almost exclusively of English coins and constitute clear example of the Bornholm inhabitants' participations, participation in the raids. It's a different scenario for the Gyllenskog hoard deposited after 1035. This charge illustrates the hoard's biography, as explained, or we could also call it the life history of the hoard. And as you can see, <clears throat> it has been accumulated over a long period of time. Uh, with different accumulation phases. We have German coins, and then we have these two market accumulation phases with English coins of the same type. The hoard includes, as mentioned, two accumulation phases in which coins were acquired through rates in England. But the hoard was deposited approximately 30 years after the raids. This suggests that the owner of the Gyllenskog hoard also took part, part in raids in England and thus were able to establish themselves at the top of the social hierarchy on Bornholm. The reason for the difference between the structures of Tuskegård on your left and Gyllenskog on your right must be found in the context of the position. The English coins in the Tuskegee hoard was deposited shortly after the acquisition as a, as a symbolic act, perhaps as a sacrifice for newly cultivated fields. The English coins in the Gyllenskog hoard were part of a hoard accumulated over a longer period and then deposited in a house. Here you can see the excavation plan. Uh, 
it, the houses uh, were built of wood and is of course not preserved. But when we excavate, we can see the traces of the houses as dark uh, patches in, in the ground. And this shows that uh, this is a, a wall, the gable, these two posts uh, carried the roof. And here we have the deposition place of the hoard. A closer analysis of the context suggests that part of the hoard was collected in, the, I mean, uh, the, the context within the hoard. Uh, suggests that uh, a part of the hoard was collected in a small purse together with a few pieces of silver and a weight. The structure and deposition context of the hoard shows that the accumulation was a dynamic process in which parts of the hoard was reenacted. Activated. When you have the hoard in your house, you can go and you can take out some silver next time you go on a, on a journey and then you can put some silver back uh, when you come back from your journey. Although the hoard was deposited approximately 30 years after the raids in England, the hoard's biography reflects that one of several members of the family at Gutenskog also participated in the raids. The profile of Gutenskog of the Gutenskog hoard also reflects that weights were merely one of several accumulation strategies. Sorry. This fantastic Finnish Baltic fire steel on your right were also deposited in the Gutenskog hoard and shows possible contacts to the north and east. The fire steel may have been acquired during a trip to Birka, an important trading town in Sweden. Several graves in Birka area contained one or more Finnish objects, also contained scales and or weights, indicating the buried were part of a super regional networks of people involved in the exchange and sales of good. Uh, when we find weights, it's an indication of trade because the Vikings didn't um, uh, trade, for example, coins by numbers, but they traded coins by uh, by weight and other silver objects uh, by weight. Immediately east of the deposition place of the Gutenskog hoard, a set of four bronze weights were found. The presence of fire steel and weights at Gutenskog thus form a clear parallel to the Birka graves. This makes it probable that the people who collected and deposited the Gutenskog hoard were part of the same super regional network of exchange and trades of goods as those buried in Birka. The life history of the Gutenskog hoard may thus reflect the life history of its owner. Set in a narrative frame, it may have happened in the following way. In his or her youth, the Gutenskog man or woman went on raids to England and accumulated silver. As the years went by and the stomach got thicker and the sword hand grew tired, the weapons were replaced by scales and weights and raids were replaced by trading journeys. And now I will introduce you to the last Viking in the world, the owner of the Smidegård Hoard. The Smidegård Hoard consists of silver and gold objects deposited in two containers. The hoard is considered as one hoard with two deposition units. Deposition one was disturbed by agricultural activity, while depos deposit two was found undisturbed only 80 centimeters away. The silver objects in deposit one was tightly packed in a wooden box made of ash tree, as you can see here, uh, while it is excavated at the conservation facilities. The box was probably deposited uh, with, the, with the bottom up, indicating that the objects found in the plow layer originally were at the bottom of the box. These objects include a relic cross, three coins, two beads, an ingot, and some pieces of scrap silver. At the top of the deposit were another relic cross, three ingots or melts, and a bead. 
during excavation, the lower part of the deposit uh, appeared first, of course, because it was bottom up. Here was a Edward Confessor coin minted between 1042 to 66, and a silver bead and a 90 centimeter long chain with animal head twinned in the entire box. As you can see here, here's the chain surrounding the hoard. And here you can see in the X-ray that the chain lay in the entire box. At one end of the box, the melts and ingots lay close together from bottom to lid. Uh, a carry ring, probably for the large relic cross, was placed above the long chain at the top of the box, this ring. The chronological profile of the hoard spans 100 years. Among the oldest objects are a German Otto Adelheid a penny type 5 coin minted between 1025 to 60 and an English Edwin Confessor coin from minted from 1046 to 48. Further, the scrap silver, the beads and of the hoard also points to the 11th century. The relic crosses were probably produced in the first half of the uh, 12th century, and the hoard's youngest objects are two German bracteates indicating deposition after 1152. The oldest objects appear to have been at the bottom of the box, indicating that the box was used to store valuables for many years. Both the nature of the objects and the context of their deposition points to several phases of accumulation successively added to the wooden box. So this is also a case where you have had the wooden box probably in the house and you have accumulated the silver hoard over a long period of time. The heavy melts were packed in one side and have just and have uh, been kept together as a unit. Both relic crosses were located at the bottom of the box, while the carrying ring, which may have belonged together with the large uh, relic cross, was located at the top. This means that the cross and the suspension were separated at the time of deposition. Deposit 2 was found undisturbed by the plough and was fully excavated at the conservation facilities. Remains of strip of strips of birch bark was found and must have formed the container of the hoard. The strips did not seem braided and there was probably no basket or but rather birch bark strips wrapped around the silver. The upper layer of the hoard consisted of large uh, smoothened melts. Beneath these lay the, the jewelry consisting of a braided neck ring that almost formed a barrier to the other uh, jewelry and a relic cross with the chain, a twisted arm ring and a gold ring that was placed slightly to one side. Beneath the jewelry was a bark parcel containing, containing 20 mils. In both deposit one and two, the mills were separated from the other objects. The two silver finger rings lay under the bark parcel, and the bottom of the hoard, uh, and at the bottom of the hoard, facing upside down, so that it almost formed a, a bowl, was this fantastic large uh, filigree decorated oval brooch, measuring. 13.2 centimeters in diameter. The objects in deposit two also span over a long period. The large circular filigree decorated brooch dates to the 11th century, where along the edge and the hole in the middle, probably also due to wear, show that the brooch was much used when deposited. Uh, the braided neck ring with oval end plates and the twisted arm and finger rings are classic Viking Age types, a parallel, parallel to the unusual end no, uh, knobs of the ring is found in a Gotlandic hoard from the mid thousands. 
the flat ring up here in the corner with incised cross and yellow probably dates to the 12th century. In contrast to the oval brooch, the braided neck ring and the twisted arm and finger rings appear to be almost newly made. The design of the twisted arm and finger rings is so uniform that it's likely that the jewelry were made, was made uh, at the same time as a jewelry set. The absence of circulation marks and the lack of traces of use suggest that the deposition took place shortly uh, after the time of production. If the two units were deposited at the same time, this must have occurred after 1152, as indicated by the German uh, Brexits. The organization of the objects suggests a deposition event in which the objects were carefully arranged, wrapped in birch bark strips and deposited. The fact that the hoard's presumably youngest objects the band-shaped fingering with yellow is placed immediately above the hoard's presumably oldest objects, the circular brooch, and subsequently covered by several older objects, suggests that the organization, wrapping, and deposition uh, constituted a single, a single deposition event. The Smithergård site is notably the only site with extensive excavations where extensive excavations have been carried out in order to clarify the overall structure of the settlement and the location of the hoard in relation to it. Otherwise, the excavations are all are quite limited. As you can see here, this is the excavated area and, and these are uh, trenches, search trenches uh, excavated. Here you have the house and over in this area uh, was where the, the hoard was found. The Smithgård hoard uh, were located uh, five to six meters from a fire layer with large amounts of charred grains covering at least two post hole, holes and a pit uh, that can be interpreted as a small building or a stack. So they have probably uh, deposited uh, their the silver uh, away from the house, or they have deposited the silver away from the house. Grains from the fire layer is C14 dated, and it is uh, contemporary with the hoard. 75 meter northwest of the hoard, a small east-west orientated house was uncovered. The house uh, is has irregular internal post settings, uh, perhaps because uh, some of the posts were placed on stones. Uh, what you have to note here is that the length of the house is uh, only 12 and a half meter. This is the remains of the house. This lavish content of the hoard stands in sharp contrast to the site context, which reflects a very modest settlement in a marginal area of the island. It is, for example, difficult to imagine the occupants of the small, this small uh, post-built house of just over 12 meter walking around with this extravagant relic cross, which were deposited in the hoard. A possible interpretation of the Smidgård hoard is that it is the case of eluded goods uh, the deposition of silver hoards by large seemed to end with the introduction of Christianity. Bonhomme's youngest uh, Viking hoard has a market present of Christian artifacts and thus seems to carry an inherited uh, contradiction in relation to this link between deposition stop and Christianity. The hoard is without comparison Bonhomme's largest silver hoard. However, the extravagant content sharply contrasts to the site context, which reflects a very modest settlement in a peripheral area of the island. 
One suggested interpretation of the Smedegård hoard is that it is plunder, and it is tempting to declare the owners of the Smedegård hoard to be the last raiding Vikings of Bornholm, and probably also the last Vikings of the world. Thank you for your attention. Peter, that was fantastic, especially I, I like the way you uh, end that with the last Vikings very dramatic. <laughs> Um, Thank you. <laughs> I'm sure there are a lot of questions, um, but I will uh, just jump right in as everybody else is getting their questions ready. I, I do have a question about the Schmettigod Hoard ingots that, that you showed there. Yeah. Um, the ones wrapped in birch bark. Are, are those of a consistent weight um, or, or are they? There are different uh, types of ingots in the hoard but the ones I showed are uh, quite consistent in the weight and are uh, a type of uh, a, a medieval type uh, which is also found in in German hoards for example. Hmm. And what, what was the purpose of wrapping them in uh, birch bark do you think? Well uh, good question. Uh, I imagine that deposit one is like a, a box where they have accumulated over a long time then something happens and they need to stash away their silver and uh, they quickly have to like, you know, wrap it into something. So it's like you could put it in a bag, but you could also put it in birch bark. Uh, it's it's because of very good uh, preservation conditions that it's uh, preserved. Perhaps a lot of hoards were deposited in birch bark. Fantastic. Um, do we have any uh, any other questions for Dr. In in Ingbardson? Sorry. Sam, do we the There's chat? a question in the chat. Yeah. Right. Checking there. Um, yeah, Mary Lennon is asking only one gold item. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> only one gold. Oh, no. We have uh, another hoard, another of the Viking hoards, where with the uh, gold, uh, fragmented gold, which were probably used as a, as a form of currency. Uh, but it is uh, silver, silver, silver. So it's very. And then we have. Uh, oh no, um, that's not true. We also have a, a hoard with a gold fingering, and three fantastic gold coins. Uh, but it is unusual to find gold in the Viking hoards. And what do you think that is? Well, it's it's uh, probably a a question of of uh, like currency. <laughs> right. it, it was easier to use uh, silver as a currency, I think. Yeah. Mm. Um, but actually, more and more uh, fragmented sil uh, gold objects are occurring on the Bonhomme sites, uh, and John Kershaw has made some. Um, Surveys also on the English material uh, indicating that uh, gold did uh, function as currency. Hmm. Yes, that's interesting. Um, Mike Markovitz is asking in the chat no Byzantine coins? Um, a few, I think, but perhaps like two or three. Uh, out of these 10,000 coins. Very good. Byzantine coins are a bit earlier on one hunt. And uh, Gilles Bronsberg is asking more hordes in these islands than on the mainland? Yes, definitely. Definitely more hordes on, on the islands. Uh, probably the... the um, There's a question of uh, of uh, detector archaeology, um, which I have to touch upon uh, uh, regarding to this question, because um, they are very active with the metal detectors uh, on on Bonholm, and that is probably also why we find all these uh, these hordes. But but on the other hand, uh, Gotland, which is also uh, situated next to Bonholm in the Baltic Sea. They don't use detectors there and they have a lot of hordes. So it is because that uh, they they have been on this trade route from, from east, uh, oh, yeah. some from south to north, <laughs> that there are so many hordes. Mm, very good. Um, 
And Sarah Miller is asking in the chat, I found it fascinating that some of these hordes are believed to be linked to women due to the jewelry found. What else do we know about these women? Perhaps not in particular as their stories were lost, but in general. Well, we know, um, well, you have also, if you've seen the Vikings, <laughs> no. uh, they are some of the Icelandic sagas have uh, mentioned uh, women, but it, it is, they are a bit hidden because they are, the sagas are mostly uh, mention, mentioning uh, men. Uh, we have women uh, depicted on different kinds of uh, brooches, uh, also with weapons and then we have uh, some very interesting um that's a very interesting uh, grave in in uh, is it birka i think uh, where you have this uh, grave with uh, full weapon uh, equipment and uh, analysis of of uh, the skeleton shows that it's a woman so i think it's a a, a topic that we need to develop so Um, uh, Daniel Wolf is asking, um, how do so many Arabic coins travel there? Uh, well, that's a good question. Uh, probably by the Vikings, uh, did not just go to the England. They just as much went, uh, to the East and to the South. Uh, but we can also see that, uh, that most of the coins were traded in the Volga Bulgarian area in present-day uh, Russia. Uh, so it is trade routes, probably, primarily, that uh, that, it's, that caused these like silver uh, flows from the Islamic area to the Vikings. And then they are uh, preserved in Scandinavia because they they dug them down. They didn't. They, they didn't do that in the Islamic area. They remelted them and used them. But, but because of a more primitive ec economic situation in Scandinavia, the hordes were uh, deposited, probably, and that's why we find them today. Very interesting. Uh, Mike Carlin, also in the chat, is asking: Are any of the numismatic items displayed in the museums on the island of Bornholm, or are they mostly in the National Museum? They are mostly in the National Museum. Easy question. <laughs> Easy question, yes. <laughs> Which have a, a very nice exhibition on Vikings at the moment. If every, anyone comes to Copenhagen, where a lot of these items actually are uh, displayed. Very good. Um, Renato Schindler is asking, are most of the finds related to metal detection or are in the old fashioned way, which I presume is archaeology? All finds are related to metal detection. All the finds that I have presented are found with metal detectors. Okay. Also, an easy question. Right. Um, and we have a we have a bit of a problem on Bonholm because they are so active that uh, that they find one or two new hordes every year. Uh, so we know of, of about probably. 40 hordes, which has not been surveyed or excavated yet. Uh, and we simply haven't got the capacity to excavate them all. Uh, very good. Um, are there any other questions, either for the chat or if you just want to raise your hand? Uh, we've got a comment. Oh, Mike Markovitz. Is saying manga talk. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Al is saying there was a PBS program recently on the Viking women warriors. Yeah. Okay. Great. Story, right? Yeah, it is very, very fascinating. Very interesting. I think. Yeah. And um, I oh, and uh, Jamie is asking: Does the National Museum offer pages in English? If so, what is the website? Uh, yes, they do. Uh, I think I can. Can I write here? Yeah. Sure, we can drop that in the chat there too. If you Google, yeah, I'm sure you will find it. Yeah. Um, as we're uh, closing in on the top of the hour, Gita, I'd like to thank you again. And I have to say um, congratulations 
on displaying both your dual nature as a numismatist and an archaeologist by invoking Pierre Bourdieu as uh, <laughs> your theoretical, <laughs> for providing theoretical insight to what you're doing. I have to say, you probably are the first one to, uh, uh, that I've heard of anyway, invoking Bordeaux on and your, uh, and, and your uh, theoretical um, uh, program there. So I, it worked for me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Uh, so just thank you again. Really appreciate you spending an hour with us um, during thank our you. lunch hour. And I, I know you're, I'm sure, anxious to get to your dinner. Since, uh, Perhaps a, a glass of wine and some dinner is going right. to be nice in the sun. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much for the invitation. Yes. And uh, take care. <laughs>